Good evening, everyone. Okay. Oh, looks like maybe Rachel's frozen. So I'll keep going. Good, e good evening, everybody. We are here for our first in motion group. And this is a group where we're going to focus on our nine to 12 year olds and their families, um, particularly this first event, we're going to be focusing on uh, the whole family. And we have Meg Withington with us, and she's going to talk about everybody's mental health throughout the family. And um, that's our that's our main topic today. And uh, Rachel, do you want to introduce Meg to us officially? Yes, I apologize, you guys. I'm having internet issues. I um, I see some familiar faces. It's great to see everybody join us if you want to come on camera. We are so excited to have Dr. Meg Clark Withington with us, who is a brand new, well, she is not brand new University of Chicago, but she is now an associate professor of psychiatry specializing in GI. So we are thrilled to have her. She is an extended part of our team here at U of C. And we are just looking forward to a really thoughtful evening. I think, Lindsay, did you go over the Q&A and the chat function? Nope. So we want this to be interactive. Um, Dr. Clark Withington is going to um, speak to us. Meg is going to speak to us a little bit this evening. And then please put questions um, in the Q&A function, we will address them. We're going to have plenty of time for questions. And we are just so happy to see familiar faces and new faces. And we look forward to a great evening. Dr. Whittington, I'd love to turn it over to you. Okay. Let me just work on sharing my screen. As we were just talking about sometimes this poses issues. Um, and what can you all see? It's the presenter view. Really? Mm hmm So weird. Um, we go through this every time. This is what we were talking about with Meg earlier. Every time we do a presentation, we figure it out all in advance, and then it doesn't work right. OK, let's see how this works. What can you yeah, see now? That's it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for helping me problem solve that. Okay. Um, so, uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be presenting to you all today. Um, so, my name is Meg Clark Withington. Um, I am a pediatric psychologist. I am very eagerly awaiting to start my position um, at UChicago. I haven't started yet, but I will be an associate professor with the psychiatry department. And I'm going to be working specifically with um, our GI team. Um, and as part of that interdisciplinary team, my role is really going to be to support your children and you, your families, in coping with celiac disease, but I also support other um, gastroenterology-related conditions as well. I also do like to disclose to families um, that... I don't have a diagnosis of celiac disease. However, my sister and my dad both do have celiac disease. So it is um, a disease that is close to me. Um, I also have a lot of aunts and cousins who are diagnosed as well. So I've watched people go through this process. And I can assure you the beginning is tough. It's really hard for families. It's hard for kids. It's hard for parents. Um, but I also know that the quality of life gets so much better um, for individuals who do have celiac if they stick with that gluten-free diet, but it's a transition no matter where you are and when you are diagnosed. Um, so I hope that provides some comfort for parents who are watching their children go through this. It does get better. Okay. Um, so for our agenda today, we will be talking about some of the psychosocial impacts of celiac disease on the family. Um, I'm going to be talking about parent roles, and then we'll transition into building resiliency and coping across a number of different environments. Um, so our talk today, my talk today is really focused a lot on parents, um, but if, ch if kids have questions as we go through, put them in the chat and I will help answer them um, once we're finished. Um, just know that there is a place for you in this, in this talk as well. 
Uh, so when we think about the family-wide effects of celiac disease, I really liked this um, graphic because it shows all the different interconnecting um, relationships amongst parents, amongst kids with and without celiac disease in relation to the child who is first diagnosed um, with celiac disease in the family. Um, there's limited research um, in the area of siblings, and so I wanted to highlight some of the things that the siblings said in this study. There were 24 siblings that were asked some questions about how they felt about their roles in their family with another child with celiac disease. So for siblings who have that child with celiac disease, they found um, that it was really helpful um, to have somebody else in the family who was able to maintain a safe home with them. So they had that camaraderie and that support from a family member. But there was also some concerns that sometimes one sibling follows you know, a different regimen than the other. Maybe they're more strict, maybe they're more relaxed depending on symptoms. Um, so sometimes that can cause some conflicting issues and cause some tension between the child with celiac disease and the sibling with celiac disease. For siblings without celiac disease, we saw, um, or the study saw rather, that um, these kids were able to develop empathy and care for others um, outside of their family. So they saw an increase in empathy, but they, I just think that's so cool. Um, some of the stressors that they, that they report were um, increased effort to maintain safe gluten-free homes, maybe feeling like they had a limited choice in restaurants, also report receiving less attention in their family, maybe from their parents or their siblings. For parents, um, we see that parents broadly say that they liked seeing the health outcomes of their child with celiac improve. Um, they liked that there was creativity around meals, that they were cooking healthier, that maybe they were creating new traditions um, for their family. Some of the things that um, incurred some stress include increased expenses, increased shopping, maybe feeling guilt. Um, and when I say these things, when I talk about all of these impacts, both positive and negative, we're thinking about them in more of a neutral way. We're thinking about them as these are things that are just happening in our family, and they're things that we can problem solve and figure out how to make it work for our family. Think about things that do work, think about things that don't work, but knowing what the problems and the and the positives are ahead of time can help us become more effective at problem solving in the future. So we're going to transition to talking about the evolving roles of parents. Um, and we'll get to why I did this swift transition to evolving roles of parents, because um, I think it's really important to talk about the empowerment that knowing what your role is as a parent over time is really important. It can help us help our kids build resiliency over time. So when we think about our kids, specifically in this nine to 12 year old range, it's childhood, maybe it's middle childhood. Some kids are a bit more mature than others, but we're thinking about parent roles in their child's diagnosis as their CEOs, right? They're allowing their children to observe what they're doing in order to manage their care, but your child is not necessarily responsible for everything related to their care at this moment in time. Over time, you become managers and supervisors when you get into middle childhood, early adolescence, and into adolescence. We want you to engage your child in partial participation. So maybe they're, um, you're kind of like doing hand over hand, guiding them to do things that you would normally do for them on a regular basis that's developmentally appropriate. Um, all the way to transitioning to you're allowing your child to manage tasks independently that they've seen you do before or that you've really helped them with. Maybe they need some prompting, maybe they need some correction, but you're allowing them to kind of make some of those mistakes under your wing. Ultimately, we want them to become um, CEOs of their own diagnosis, right? So their role shifts to CEO. You're more of a consultant once they get into that young adulthood age. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about this transition of skills and transition skills acquisition is because the transition of care and information of knowledge is really powerful. It's powerful for you. It's powerful for your child. And learning that celiac disease in appropriate stepwise ways is going to help your child feel like they can manage their own care in the future, manage what they can now, right, appropriately, but also in the future, they're going to be able to be independent. And that can be really important to think about for the long term. Um, so thinking about um, asking your child about their symptoms and concerns prior to medical visits, 
um, so that you can share with their team or they can share with their team will increase the communication between you and your child. It will allow for more conversations in those appointments about treatments and approaches. And over time, your child is going to learn how to navigate those appointments because you've paved the way for them to feel informed because they're observing what you're doing. Um, it promotes healthy coping. Of course, we're always going to emphasize communication when it comes to um, uh, attending medical appointments, talking with your children. Um, and, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, parents, especially at this 9 to 12 age range, are probably the most important source of information for your kids. Um, you can bridge the gap for them about any questions that they might have about celiac. They can ask you questions. You can listen to them. You can ask them what they know. Um, and your, your discussions with your child at this point should also grow with your child. So maybe for kids, you know, in your house, saying things like gluten will hurt your belly is better um, and less scary sounding than using words like small intestine, absorption, um, inflammation, whereas older kids can benefit from having a bit more complex conversations about celiac disease. Um, check in with your children on a regular basis too. We know that kids change so fast, right? They change their values. They change their feelings. There's peer pressure. There's puberty. Um, it's really easy for parents to sometimes assume that kids have the same level of information and knowledge that we do, um, but agent development really has a big impact on how kids process information. So I like to tell parents, you know, when a visit is coming up with your GI team, maybe that's the time that you check in with your kid about how things are going. Correct what you need to, um, praise what they do know, um, keeping these lines of communication really open and having regular check-ins is going to be so important because it sets the stage for tackling some of these other challenges that might come up, like helping when your child feels different. And I would, I wonder if some of the kids in the audience um, do sometimes feel different at school or at social activities. Um, and again, that communication piece is really key. So for younger kids, um, I really recommend just keeping it practical and informational. Um, you know, you can't have this food, but here are all the things that you can have, right? So you're going to want to really listen to what your child is saying, validate their observation, said, you're right, you're eating a different food, and then refocus on back on what kids on what they can have. So it's really an emphasis on what they can versus what they can't have. Um, that will help your child kind of see like, oh, well, these kids are also eating celery or these kids are also eating, you know, chips. Like I am just like them in that sense. As your kids get older um, or maybe, you know, they're a bit more mature in their developmental time frame, um, it's really important to find ways to have the conversations take a more mature tone, more complex tone. Um, but it's still kind of similar to how we would talk with younger children. So listening to re listening reflectively. Um, saying, you know, I hear that you're upset that there weren't great food options for you at the football game, offering empathy. That must have been really frustrating. You must have felt really, you might have felt really left out. Um, but then refocusing back on their core strengths and things that make them similar to other kids. Like, well, you all really enjoy watching the football game. Um, or you guys enjoy like leaving early and going to do some other activity. Um, you know, really emphasizing that there are other parts of social activities that don't necessarily include food that are still really fun and valuable to your children. Um, it also is important to think about how you can help prepare your child for when they're talking to others. And it's inevitable that one of their peers is going to ask them a question, become curious, and sometimes this can leave kids feeling like deer in the headlights. And so prior to this coming up, and maybe this is something that you can do over the weekend or, um, you know, in the next few days is creating somewhat of an elevator pitch or, you know, creating a line for them to say. And you can practice it with them and you can figure out what works for them, what feels good for them to say. But they can say, you know, I have celiac disease. It can be serious. I can't share food, but I can have. And then saying all the things that they can have. If they feel comfy saying what happens to them, if they're exposed, they can disclose that. There's no pressure. Um, and then for teens, sometimes it's just kind of like, you know, I'm really allergic to gluten, man. Like, I can't have that. And then you just move on. I would say most kids are pretty receptive to understanding, and then they're able to move on if they get that information. 
Um, so I think just having your child prepared for this, because it can be really scary if it comes up, that they'll know what to say. And you practice it with them when there's low stakes, um, and they'll be able to pull it out um, when they're with their friends or peers or somebody who's asking them a question about cel celiac. And of course, you know, when coping with a chronic health condition, we have these expected things that might pop up that we can prepare for. Um, but unexpected things are going to happen, right? It's so impossible to predict and prevent every single challenge um, that your child might experience as much as we would want to. And so instead of focusing on like, well, how can I prevent my, my child from feeling bad? Or how can I prevent something um, from feeling challenging for them? Our goal is really to promote resiliency in the response to challenges so that kids have the tools that they need to rebound from difficulties with relative ease. I'm not going to lie that this is hard. This is really hard for parents. It's hard for kids. It's hard to feel like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And I don't expect it. And, you know, psychologists don't expect it to feel great or easy. Um, but we do know that appropriate levels of discomfort do ultimately promote resiliency in children and in adults too, in all kids, whether or not they do or don't have a chronic medical condition. It's all about finding a balance, communicating with your child, understanding your children and their needs, while also reinforcing that they can do these really hard things. So one of the biggest things that we can do is encourage our children to face difficulties when they arise instead of allowing avoidance of challenges. And you'll see on this slide, I have this graphic, I love this graphic, I use it a lot, um, where we see the cycle of anxiety. And I think that all of us can relate to this, whether or not it's homework that we don't feel like doing, maybe it's a work project that we're just like, I don't feel like doing that, a phone call we need to make. We avoid because it's giving us some worried feelings and it's like, oh, great, I don't have to think about it right now. Like, this is awesome. But at some point, that phone call is going to need to get make, made. That homework's going to need to get done. And now it feels like it's a bigger burden. It feels more worrisome. We're more worried about it. But maybe we just continue to avoid. And so you can see how this cycle actually increases our anxiety over time. We want our children to learn how to approach things that feel scary, appropriately scary. We're not looking to make them terrified of things um, so that they aren't reinforced that this is, you know, a way to cope with things that feel uncomfortable. And I think that this cycle really builds on itself when we think about parents too, because parents get anxious that their kids are anxious. And so parents tend to avoid doing things that are going to make their children anxious. And you can see how that really compounds itself over time. So again, we want to encourage them to face these challenges. We're going to provide appropriate modeling affect. So really calm, encouraging tones, smiles, praise, and then also teaching them how to deal with these big emotions that come up. Anxiety might be deep breathing strategies. You can do this, positive affirmations, um, you know, just really finding a lot of encouraging words and support and helping your child feel like, I've got this, like I can do this, this is okay. Um, so again, we can promote our child's resiliency by anticipating and preparing for some of these challenges. So when we think about anticipating and preparing, we're also building that, that we're, we're eliminating that avoidance piece. So this can include things like warning children about tests or procedures in a really calm, informational, age-appropriate way before the day of the scheduled visit. I wouldn't recommend doing it too far ahead, especially if your child is super anxious, but a day or two ahead of time will help them navigate some of those feelings. You can talk through them. You can get through them together. Um, this also includes thinking about ways that you can help your child participate and navigate social events bringing safe foods to an event, having a meal prepared ahead of time, having an exit plan can sometimes be helpful if the kids are just like, you know, I really got to go. If your kid is really avoiding participating in um, social events currently, um, you can think about a really stepwise strategy to get them back to participating fully, more of a rehabilitative approach. So you think about an activity that's happening in the next week or two, and you make a plan with your child. Okay, you're going to go in and I'm going to sit outside. And if you want to leave in 30 minutes, you can come out and we can leave. Or I'm going to go, I'll be back in an hour. Or I'll walk in with you and see how it feels. And I'll stay if you want me to, or I'll leave if you want me to. So thinking about being flexible um, while still allowing them to engage in that activity that feels scary. 
Carrying an allergy card can also help alleviate some of the anxiety around you know, talking to waiters or staff. Just kind of makes it easier to be like, hey, can you just read this and know that this is a big thing for our family? Easier to share allergies with staff. It just kind of eliminates the extra communication. Um, I also like to remind families that it's important to maintain family routines. This actually builds resiliency too. It's really tempting maybe to stop eating gluten in front of your child. But again, we're just really reinforcing this idea that they can't handle and tolerate somebody eating gluten around them. We want them to be prepared for that because it's inevitable that they're going to come across somebody in their day or days where they're eating, glu eating gluten. And so we need them to be okay with that and gain confidence um, to face that social situation. Um, also, you know, when it comes to any sort of um, routines or problem behaviors or a disciplinary approach that you've used in the past, maybe you've let up on it because you feel guilty because your child has a condition, we really encourage you to get back to baseline with those things too. This also helps to maintain a lot of consistency in your child. They know what to expect and it becomes very comforting that they know what they're navigating at home, especially since there are so many uncertainties when you do have gluten or when you do have celiac disease that you want to just maintain that certainty in all ways, shapes, or forms that you can. And then finally, we want to help our children maintain school and academic success. Um, so there are going to be days where your child can, you'll want your child to be able to successfully go to school, even if they're not feeling great, or they might be worried about not feeling great. And so talking with your medical team to allow for accommodations at school, help kids feel safe in the classroom and safe at school um, so they're not missing quite as much. So these are things like um, writing into a plan that they have access to a private bathroom, the ability to leave class without permission. Um, maybe they have preferred seating in the classroom so they can leave quietly without interrupting anybody. Maybe they have extra time for assignments if a child is missing a lot of school because they are ill. Um, but as with all avoidance behaviors, we really encourage parents to find that balance of sending your child to school and keeping them home. I also really like to reinforce the parents to just pay attention to grades. If grades start to fall away from what their baseline is, that's a really good time to check in about deeper issues, maybe to do with celiac, maybe to do with something else. Um, and this is for everyone, right? When to seek more help. So it is totally normal to feel sad, anxious, frustrated, worried. Um, sometimes. Um, but when these feelings stop us from doing things that we really like or that we need to do, it's time to seek additional support. So parents checking in with your kids regularly or paying attention to their habits is going to be very important. You should also pay attention to your own habits and how you're feeling as well. If you do feel like you need extra support, talk with your parents, kiddos, talk with your parents. Um, parents can look on Psychology Today. That's where I usually um, tell people to go to, you can call your insurance company to talk with a psychologist or a therapist who can help you navigate some of these big feelings because you're not alone. Um, and you know, you deserve to have support and comfort and find ways to navigate some of these big feelings that you might be feeling. And that's all I have. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Um, I also, I meant to say this at the beginning, um, I am eight months pregnant, so that's why I'm kind of huffing and puffing through um, this presentation. Um, but yes, I'm really looking forward to hearing and seeing all your questions. And um, yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Well, I encourage, um, you can put your questions at the Q&A. If you feel comfortable off mute and ask um, Dr. Whittington if you have questions for her. And I also want to welcome Dr. Burma, who I think I just saw in our who joined as well. Hi, Dr. Verma. And I'm sure she's a familiar face to a lot of you. So does anyone, to kick things off, does anyone have a question initially to start? Anyone want to ask one? Well, oh, <laughs> I see maybe a hand. Maybe not. Okay. Um, yes. Is it okay if we? Sorry, yeah. we're having trouble with our. Um, I know how to get the hand to work. Uh, you know what? I'll come. I'll come back when I figured out the camera. Thanks. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. Um. So I I'll start with a question for Dr. Withington just to get us started. 
on things. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about siblings. Um, and do you have a tip for when siblings, when you're first diagnosed, how to incorporate siblings as part of the process of adapting to a gluten-free lifestyle? Do you mean for parents or for, for themselves? Um, how about from um, like the child themselves, from their perspective of just like dealing with your brother and sister who can you fight with kind of normally anyway and can have um, just, you know, regular sibling interactions, but just how do you um, create like a supportive environment? Yeah. How would you recommend that? So, you know, I think keeping things as normal as possible can sometimes feel really helpful to your sibling who has just been diagnosed with celiac because they might be feeling pretty bummed or down or sad. Maybe they're feeling really happy. Maybe they find a lot of relief in knowing like, hey, this is what's going on with me. Um, so I think keeping things as normal as possible, as possible as you can. Um, and then finding ways to support your sibling can be really helpful too and help you feel really empowered as well. Asking questions is okay. Um, you know, making jokes can sometimes be a really good way to alleviate some of the stress around getting a new diagnosis. Um, I don't know if any of the siblings or any kids who are on the call have any recommendations. I feel like they would be the true experts here. Um, what do you think? How did you support your sibling when they were diagnosed with celiac? Is that a hand, Kathy, for this question or is it a hand for something else? Um, it's for a different question. Okay, got Thanks. it. Of course. Oh, yes. Hi. Hi there. Um, so we are Dan and Sasha. Our 12-year-old is sitting to the side eating some dinner um, and we have a 15-year-old um, both of our girls are actually celiac diagnosed, but our younger daughter was diagnosed first at age six. Mm -hmm. um, and our older daughter wasn't diagnosed for a year later. Mm -hmm. And for us, just to respond to your question, the older daughter had had a peanut allergy since she was about three and a half. And so our family understood the importance of um, being cautious with certain foods. And that really helped our older daughter and our younger daughter understand each other and understand the importance of caution and just how to, how to navigate that and then learning gluten versus peanuts and you know all those pieces too. So I think that for our family, and I don't know if others have experienced this day and age, there's a lot more food allergies than when we were kids. Um, so it's a lot more common, I think, for this generation of children to understand versus when we were growing up. So likening it to a food allergy um, really worked well in our household. And then a year later, our older daughter was diagnosed also. And so we became just a gluten-free, peanut-free household. <laughs> I have a question for you. So when you have, so I have three children and two of them have celiac disease and my eldest has had peanut and tree nut and all those allergies for quite some time. So she has had those allergies when since she was one year of age um, and then got diagnosed with celiac when she was 12. My son was diagnosed when he was six and he had symptoms. She did not. In your family, I'm always curious about this. Do you take the peanut allergies as more serious than the gluten issue? And, or is it vice versa, knowing that there is an EpiPen somewhere? Is this for us, Ms. Yeah. Verma? Yeah, okay. it's for you. Um, yeah, so for us, at first we did, um, because the, you know, the life-threatening nature of a peanut allergy with an EpiPen, you know, is more imminent than being glutened uh, for our younger daughter at that time. We also started out on a real educational journey. Um, it took our younger daughter three years to get into normal lab work levels. Um, so we really, I cried for days when we got those normal labs. Um, it, it, they didn't even know why I was crying. I was like, yeah, you guys are too young to understand and appreciate the gravity of this. Um, but to answer your question, 
the peanut allergy always did trump. And I like to say to like extended family members, mm -hmm. it took us three years to get to that normal range. And for our younger daughter, normal range meant a very exclusively gluten-free <laughs> lifestyle. So we started out just probably gluten light as we were learning and going through that process. Um, and she's, it, what we've learned is a very sensitive celiac. And so it took us three years to get to a place where she was in normal range. And I tell family members, look, it took three years for us to get to this level of crazy, you know, compared to people who don't understand that gluten-free lifestyle. We didn't just become this. We had to go on this journey and get to this level because that's what she needed to be healthy and thriving. Um, and I just appreciate all the things that um, have been mentioned in this PowerPoint. We've you know, our younger daughter is now 12, turning 13 in a month. So she's about to age out of this grouping and our older daughter's 15. And all these things that you've talked about are things that our family has really tried to do. Um, and it's been this really amazing organic journey of my goal as a parent, as a mom, was I wanted my girls to be able to enjoy and thrive in life just like everybody else. Um, and so my goal was to find as many alternatives and substitutes, we do the 504 plans at schools, you know, all those things to normalize the playing field for them. We are entering this new place of teenagerdom and navigating social situations. So that's, you know, that's going to be your next uh, forum, please. <laughs> we do have one. We have, we one. have that forum. Yeah. We have a forum. We missed it. There. We missed it. <laughs> and there's many more of those, so not to worry. And we actually are part of a whole national group as well in that age group. And um, um, Lindsay can sure. send you that yeah. information. So yes, we'll they're that. meeting Sunday. Yeah. Right. So oh. you should be able to get that. But I think it's important for everyone to sort of appreciate that um, the having celiac disease is just as bad or just as good as having the peanut allergy. Mm -hmm. The consequences are more immediate when you have a peanut allergy, the anaphylactic allergy versus a maybe a little chronic, though there are people who obviously can react within an hour or so being exposed to gluten. But sometimes I think in the mind, celiac disease becomes not as important as the gluten, as the peanut stuff. And that's where I was just uh, sort of reflecting on my own life and listening to you as well in terms of how does one associate the two things, but obviously they're both as important as the other one uh, with that one has more immediate sort of consequences there. Um, but thank you for sharing your story. And we have a number of hands up. So yes. Hannah, I have a peanut allergy also. My goodness. So what do you do with that? Sorry, and I didn't mean to clap for you, Hannah. I didn't mean to clap for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I just have my EpiPen. That's about it. And I don't eat peanuts. <laughs> that's a good thing. But do you um, read labels for, you know, when you're eating other products? Yeah. That's good. But you keep that uh, EpiPen handy all the time? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And, you know, there's all sorts of other EpiPen-like things that are coming out in the future with the nose, the nasal, and all that stuff. So... That's a good thing. And hopefully we'll have medications from a celiac standpoint as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it stinks to have some of these things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Our, our uh, family kind of mirrored that is our son had a peanut allergy and then our daughter got diagnosed with celiac. So just to mirror that same um, discussion, yeah. really. Yeah. So there you go. Many people with all this happening, the craziness, <laughs> right? But we're all learning how to cope with that, just like we heard um, with, you know, Meg mentioning about some of these things. Unfortunately, sorry, Meg, I had a different meeting, so I couldn't start right off with you. Uh, but I'm definitely going to share that PowerPoint. I want to le learn as well. Uh, but there's so much that we all need to cope with, but it's so important to lean on your family and lean on your, um, you know, whoever your care team is as well. Because just like you as children having those conditions, and struggling through that sometimes and, you know, sailing through life sometimes, uh, your parents are going through that as well. So I think that um, leaning on your teams is really important here. Um, but Kathy, you have the hand up. Shall we go with another question? Thank yeah. you. And I apologize for our tech difficulties. <laughs> this um, is the world we live in. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we have two things we kind of wanted to share or I wanted to share. Um, I'm with uh, our son, Sam. Hi. And he's 11. And he's been diagnosed for about a year and a half. And um, it still feels very new to us. Um, and I would say as his mom, we have, um, and I'm hoping for any suggestions um, from anyone. Um, he goes through like times when he's very angry about having celiac disease. And um, I struggle with trying to find words and things to, to say to help him through that. Um, so any um, suggestions would be great. And then he also has some anxiety around, um, like he's begun asking, so he's the only one with celiac disease in our family. And we're doing, we're not, the whole family is not going gluten-free. We're trying to do just Sam and kind of a combination. Um, he's had anxiety about, you know, should we wash our hands? Because if we're, he doesn't want to get gluten from our hands onto his, you know, um, utensils or things he's eating. Um, yeah. So any suggestions about those things? Is there, but seriously, that could be the easy spread if you actually touched it before I put it in the mouth. <laughs> yes. Yes. I understand why that is, ang you know, it makes me anxious too. Mm -hmm. By the way, by the way, I hate it the most. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I hear that you're feeling anxious and sad and angry. Like those are really common feelings to have when you have a diagnosis of celiac. So first of all, I just want to say you're not alone, Sam. Like these are really common feelings, um, and especially since it is a pretty new diagnosis for you, um, things will get better. They will. But we also have to problem solve what's happening in the now. Um, some things I might recommend have to do with the last slide that I showed. You know, if you feel like things are just really difficult for you to kind of get through on a day to day basis, you know, maybe it's time to think about talking to somebody regularly about some of the feelings that you're having. Um, with mom, is are you mom? Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think that reflective listening, I just heard you do some really excellent reflective listening with Sam. Um, I hear you that this is really frustrating for you. I'm um, helping him find those words and navigate the feelings that he's having. And then again, also providing him opportunities for foods that he can eat. Um, you know, making sure that you have those foods available at home can help alleviate some of the anxiety. The contamination piece is also very common in kids who have celiac um, worried about that cross contamination. Worry about, um, sorry, it went really dark in here. Um, worried about, you know, did this knife touch something? Um, so one thing you can do is use labels at home so that you can feel really prepared in the fact that okay, this is something that's had gluten in it before. This is something that didn't have gluten in it before. So I can feel really comfortable eating this thing. My sister, for example, they have a pen right by their refrigerator, and she just writes gluten or her partner will write gluten on whatever it is that they have touched. So that gives them some of comfort. Um, but again, I think the contamination piece can also become something much bigger. And so we want to kind of nip that now. So I do think that maybe talking to another provider could be helpful for you, Sam. Um, but, you know, using deep breathing strategies, this is good for everybody. Helping your body stay calm, Um you know, using really positive affirmations can also help when some of those feelings get too big too. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. I wanted if to- If I can just add to that, if I can yep. just add, I think it's important to remember, this is where we're going to talk about the difference between the peanut and the gluten, is that if you happen to touch something that has gluten in it, it is not going to hurt you. It is not going to harm you. You can go ahead and touch a, unless you have a particular condition, which is called dermatitis herpetiformis. It's a different story. Um, but if you don't have any rashes that are specific for celiac disease, and you happen to touch a loaf of bread that's got gluten in it, nothing will happen. 
all that you have to do is wash your hands before you put your hands to your mouth. So you've got to keep this in perspective that touching gluten is not harmful. And if for some reason there is an accidental thing that happens, don't freak out. We just learn from that experience and say, okay, this happened, not a great thing, but let's move on and learn what we did. Because again, when we get more anxious and the more anxious we are, that also creates some symptoms, right? So when we get anxious, our belly hurts, we feel nauseous, our head hurts and so on. So there's a lot of things that can happen. So very important that we try and keep things in perspective. All right, two hands, three hands. Let's go with cap back to Kathy. You have a follow up, and then we'll go to Daniel. I'm sure you're not Daniel, but um, that's the name on the screen itself. But go ahead, Kathy. Thank you. Um, I have had one accident with tomato soup. Actually, that's it's actually kind of ridiculous. My dad served me gluten in the tomato soup. And then I ate it. I ate it the whole thing. And then, right when I was going to bed, I I literally ran to the bathroom and threw it all up. Yeah. And, and you know, and I am really sorry that that happened. I'm sure that it was a mistake on Dad's part, and I'm sure Dad has learned that this is never going to happen again. But these things happen, right? So these things happen, and we learn from there that when we look at tomato soup, we want to make sure that there's no gluten there. And the next time, I am sure, 100%, even without knowing your dad, that this will never, ever happen again. Um, so we've learned from it, right? I'm sorry you didn't feel good. And again, it feels terrible to have had gluten, um, but these are things we learn from. So tomato soup in your home will be read 100 times. Um, okay, Daniel. What's your Hi, name? Hi, so um, my name is Hannah. My name is not Daniel for the record. I know, I know. We've got to um, change that name. you got to own that, own that yes. box. Let's make yeah, it just so, Hannah. <laughs> so um, I have dealt with um, being glutened and um, with the washing hands thing, um, it's okay, like, to add what she said. Like, it's okay if you touch something. Like, I go over to my friend's house all the time, and I feed their dog, like, dog treats that has, like, a bunch of gluten in it. And all I do afterward is I just wash my hands, and I'm fine. I've never gotten gluten from that. So you don't have – it's not, like, with peanuts. You don't have, like, <clears throat> an anaphylactic allergy where if you touch it, you're going to, like, break out in hives or something. Like, that's not – that's not going to happen. You just, you just have to wash your hands. And like, sometimes like I'll even forget to wash my hands. I'll be like, oh crud, I forgot to wash my hands. So then I'll just like go and wash my hands and I'm fine. Like, it's okay. And so what I've done is um, carry wipes around. Wipes have been like my best friend um, ever since I got diagnosed. So. I do suggest carrying around like just some antibacterial hand wipes. Um, and it, the, the hand sanitizer, the hand sanitizer, the Purell, it kills germs, but it doesn't remove allergens. So yes, it's important to carry that around, but I just would not replace it for wipes. Like I would carry around wipes too. Um, so there's that. And then um, I heard that you have some anxiety. I had a ton of anxiety. I was crazy. Like, no, I was going insane. Um, it was not even funny. So um, anxiety is good to a certain extent. Like there is good and bad anxiety. The good anxiety really helps you it will help keep you safe because that's all anxiety wants to do. It wants to keep you away from anything that will possibly hurt you. But the bad anxiety starts to protect you from unrealistic fears. Unrealistic fears are stuff that like, it's not gonna happen like ever. Like 
So you have to separate the good anxiety from the bad anxiety. The good anxiety would be like, oh, oh no, like I touched this gluten crumb. I should go wash my hands. Like that's the good anxiety. The bad anxiety is, oh no, I touched this crumb. I'm going to die. Like that's, that's not good. So you just have to be able to separate the good anxiety from the bad anxiety. I also heard that you have um, some anger, which I understand. I was really sad and angry when I first got diagnosed. I like I thought my life was over. Like I thought it like it was so bad. And then I realized, okay, it's not that bad. I can live with this. Like, oh my gosh, like these pretzels are so much better like than the gluten version. So you just have to like, you have to like, you have to find the good in your current situation. Like you just have to, you just have to be like, okay, like I'm here. I can't really do anything about it. Like they haven't found a cure yet. So I can't really do anything about it. Like, might as well, like, make the best of it. Like, what are some great, like, gluten-free substitutes? Like, these pretzels. Oh, wait, it's not. <laughs> these, these, okay. These. So, yeah. And um, we're going to be praying for you. So, yeah. That was awesome advice. Thank you so much, Lisa Jones. You guys have been so patient. Thank you. But that was amazing. We couldn't have said it better ourselves as adults. So thank you. That was amazing. And Lisa, do you want to go ahead? Hi, I'm London. I'm 12 and I've been a celiac for three years. Um, I totally get what you mean by the anxiety. I am so scared that one of my friends is going to touch my food and I'm going to get sick and it's like that deal and they're always sharing food and I feel bad that I can't really share with them and so I figured out that one thing that works for me is my mom bought this big roll of stickers from Amazon and they all say gluten-free on them so if I have something I don't want someone to eat or touch I just put the stickers on there and so everybody knows not to touch that and we're a shared house. because yeah we are a shared house that's awesome advice. You guys have the best advice. <laughs> I love the sticker idea. Thank That's you. fantastic. That is really awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And please, like that's, we want this to be interactive and please, this is amazing. I want to turn over to our um, Q&A really quickly. And Dr. Verma and Meg, one thing in our Q&A is about uh, receiving that diagnosis. And we have someone who hasn't yet shared the diagnosis with their child and was just curious for some advice. And so I, Meg, if you want to take this or Dr. Verma, I think you probably have a best practice of how you handle this in clinic as well. <laughs> so either one. Can start. Dr. Verma, would you like to go ahead? Um, I can. Uh, I think it, it truly is uh, dependent on the child and the situation as and the family. So if a child has had a lot of symptoms um, and then gets diagnosed with celiac disease, then when I have a conversation, and I usually tell the parents, let me have the first conversation. Uh, you should be the parent. You should be there to support the child, not necessarily have to be the bearer of that news. Um, it should be your clinical team giving that diagnosis and explaining. So if someone has symptoms, um, it's easier to give the diagnosis because then you have an answer for those symptoms and that's relief for the child. It's relief for everyone. If someone does not have any symptoms, then you literally have to sort of give the diagnosis in a very different way. 
So depending on the age of the child, I mean, if it's a teenager, then I give them a little bit more information about celiac disease. If it's a younger child, we talk. I talk more about, you know, if you fall down and you hurt yourself and you get a scrape on your knee, that's sort of a scrape that's happening on the inside of your belly and so on. So I don't think there is one particular answer in terms of how to break the news, but I do think that it should be the clinical team breaking the news and then the parent be there to support the child and not necessarily be the one to say, oh, you've been diagnosed with celiac disease and then have to field some of those questions. And then, you know, I think having someone uh, like Meg around is always helpful. Not every institution can have a Meg around, so that gets to be a little bit tough. But all depends really, Rachel, on the clinical symptoms or non and, you know, the age of the child. I mean, that's how I would go with that. Um, with that, But I really think it should be the clinical team and not the parent. Okay. Meg, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I like that approach a lot. Um, and I also think, you know, just like we, I talked about in the PowerPoint that that knowledge piece is really powerful, not only for parents, but also for kids to build that resiliency. Um, and so we want, it starts at the very beginning. So we want kids to be able to know that they can manage things eventually on their own, but at least in the, in the interim, be able to manage receiving the diagnosis and problem solving from there. Um, so, and also thinking about where the, where the fear is coming from. Are you afraid of upsetting your child? Are you afraid that your child is going to be upset? Really navigating that with yourself as parents can be really tricky. But again, the more you wait, the harder it's going to be for you to have that conversation with your child, especially if they are having symptoms, um, they can be really suffering. And so we want to make sure that we get them on the right track, working with their medical team to feel better. Um, and I think sometimes parents are actually quite surprised by how their kids respond to receiving a diagnosis. You know, sometimes it is really upsetting and really life-changing and very impactful. Sometimes kids are like, oh, okay. Um, other times kids are really relieved. Um, so I think putting that, well, what if the alternative to what I'm thinking happens? What if my kid is finally, finally have an answer for why my stomach hurts all the time? Um, you know, there, there are all these what ifs. We don't know necessarily how our children are going to react, especially when it's something like this. They've never dealt with this before, theoretically. Um, so yes, I think having your medical team give the information and then also remembering that knowledge and information and problem solving is ultimately power for you and your child. Um, and then helping them feel better and get healthy is really important too. Awesome. And, you know, one other thing that sometimes happens, you know, as parents, you think about celiac disease and you've got to change your diet 100% overnight. Um, I will kind of modify that discussion as well, depending on the particular child, depending on the family and so on. And I will have the conversation that you can go, again, depending on symptoms, that you could start off with one meal at a time that you could switch over. So if you start on a Monday, all your dinners, much easier to do dinner gluten-free than anything else. So you do all your dinners gluten-free and then you say the next week I'm, or the next three days later, I'm going to bring in as breakfast is gluten-free and then as lunch is gluten-free. So really working with the family based on what will work for them. And I will give choices. You know, the choice can be either switch over 100% overnight or go through this gradual process, but knowing it's a one-way street. So whichever way you go, by the end of one week, 10 days, you're 100% gluten-free. Again, all depends on the symptoms. So Rachel, I think that the family should lean on their clinical team. And as Meg said, it may not be as bad as we think, but it could be. It could easily be bad. And I think we all mentally are prepared for that. Um, but uh, children are surprising in terms of how resilient they can be. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask um, Meg a question, but to all my kids out there, I want you guys to be prepared as well. So what happens at the lunch table when some of your peers are kind of teasing you about the way your food looks a little different and, or it looks weird. So Meg, how would you suggest um, kids handle that when in the lunchroom things can get, you know, uncomfortable. And then I'd love to hear from our friends as well after um, Dr. Whittington gives us her response. So do you want to go ahead first? 
sure. Although I think that the kids in the um in the audience are going to be the true experts on this. Yes. Um, but you know, first I think it also formally really like really depends on the child, right? If you are like, you know what, I'm not going to put up with that. I am going to sit with somebody else. That could be a really good way to just put up a boundary. Boundaries are really healthy saying, nope, I don't like this. And I'm going to move away and sit with somebody else. That can be a great way to problem solve. Um, certainly, you know, getting a teacher involved, talking with your parents about how to navigate different interactions that you're having with your peers. Um, changing the conversation. Sometimes it can even be okay to be like, yeah, this does look weird, but it's really good. You know, maybe you're jealous of what I'm eating right now. Um, so kind of flipping it back on them can be like a helpful way to cope. Um, but, you know, ultimately it really depends on what your comfort is. And it looks like maybe Hannah has a recommendation for our team. Thank you. Um, so I, what I do if like some kids are being like, if some kids are being like, oh, like, oh, can, can I have that like in your lunch? Or if they're like throwing food or something. Um, if they're throwing food, I usually just yell at them to stop. And that usually works. Um, if, if it's, if there's like a rule at your school, no yelling, obviously, like, don't do that. Just ask them, hey, please stop. I'm allergic to that stuff that you're throwing. And usually that is, and usually people are like, oh, yeah, like, they're, they're allergic. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. So um, there's that. And then if someone asks, hey, like, that, that kind of looks like gross, like what you're eating. You could be like, you could take it as like, a learning opportunity for them and then you could say like oh hey like I don't that's not very nice you should never really call someone's food gross and actually this is really delicious so you can go ahead and eat your boring lunch and I can have my awesome one mm -hmm. so with sharing food um I would just say just don't like just don't um, because usually most schools actually have a rule, like don't share food. And that's like, there's a reason for that because kids with allergies, they may not know how to protect themselves like from their allergy. So like a peanut allergy kid could accept like a Reese's and then eat it and have to like go to the hospital. So I would just say, just say no to sharing food. And I'm going to pipe in with the sharing food, though, with the gluten, too. We do sometimes pack some extra gluten-free snacks in Hannah's lunch. So that way, if kids are, you know, it, with a lot of her friends that she has shared foods that we know are okay and safe to do, a lot of her friends have ended up buying those snacks because they love them so much. And it becomes the new trend because Hannah had it in her lunch and it was a little different and everybody ended up loving it. So, yep. So, um, yep. There's that. Thanks, Hannah. You know, I'm and learning so much from you tonight. You're a wealth of knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to see, um, does anyone else have other questions? Oh, Julie, do you want to go ahead? Sure. My name is Jude. I've been diagnosed with celiac for seven years now. And you know, something going back to lunch is like some of my friends, like they're not really mean about it because like a lot of my friends have like I've been in my grade with a lot of my friends and they've kind of like understood like that I have different food that they have. And, you know, sometimes they're like sometimes they're like that looks delicious. And I'm like, yeah, it does. But then sometimes I'm also like you guys are also kind of lucky because like I can't have what you guys are having and sometimes they have really good food that I don't get you know one thing I'd like to tell the parents though is um, when the children come home and even if it's as trivial as um, you know I couldn't eat that cupcake and you have 10 cupcakes in your house and you would say here you can have this but if a child comes home and is upset and which might sound trivial to you as parents I would take them very seriously because it's not that cupcake that they are concerned about it's being different it is different that I cannot participate 
in what my friends are doing. And I think sometimes as parents, and I'm one of those parents that will say, ah, it was only a cupcake or it's only this, it's only that. In our mind, it's only that, but in their mind, it's more than that food. It is that community. It's being different than others. So from a parent standpoint, I think we need to take a deep breath and say, all right, yes, this is a big deal for more reasons than one. Um, so important to remember that as well. We all forget that Are you many times class or in... to remember, right? Yeah. It's great advice, Dr. Verma. Absolutely. Hannah, I, I see your face. Did, were you coming on camera to maybe participate? Yes. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Um. So one thing that... um that I um that we have done is like for birthday parties like we would bring like a gluten-free substitute like there are these delicious cake bites that we buy and they're like so good they're better than cake like they're so good so that's a, a gluten-free substitute is a great option right. so that for everybody so that that one person is not feeling left out, but is included, and they were the one who brought the fun. So that would be, that would be like, that would be a good thing if, yeah. like, you're at a birthday party or something. Well, thanks, Hannah. And I saw Hannah Fish come on camera for a second, and I didn't know if maybe Hannah, you also had something to say. Our friend Hannah Fish. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's okay. Well, you guys are awesome. Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Withington or Dr. Verma? Oh, well, um, Dr. Verma, we have one that just came and someone is looking maybe for some updates on possible solutions to celiac medications and things like that. I don't know if we have time to answer that question, but if you do, I'll let you give In a In a nutshell, there are no medications right now. Very briefly, no medications right now. There are a couple of medications that are in the pipeline. Um, so looking very promising, but nothing right now that's out there, but definitely looking promising for the future for these children. That's awesome. I see our friends in the corner have their hands up. Kathy, do you want to go ahead? Um, how long it, how long is it going to take take until they can figure out how to make a cure for celiac? That's a great question. A lot what of was people the, on that. What was the question? What? How long is it going to take to find a cure for celiac? Well, you have a cure right now. That's your gluten-free diet, right? So just like the diabetics get their insulin as their treatment, you have gluten-free diet is your cure. But if you're thinking about medications, um, probably another five, 10 years, but it'll be there. Uh, but again, I think we all need to think about cure as what's cure for us uh, and think about you know, uh, sometimes medicines are not always a cure, but you might be able to eat some gluten and maybe you'll be not have to worry as much about cross-contamination and so on. Um, so those are sort of the medications that are in the pipeline. And that's huge, right? So everyone who lives in the celiac world, if you could get some medicine that you wouldn't have to keep on asking, are these French fries in the fryer the same fryer or not? If you didn't have to ask those questions, that I think is success, right? We would all agree that would be success. And if we can get a medicine that we could eat a little bit of gluten, that's mm -hmm. even better. Um, but definitely, I think in in you children who are on the screen, um, it'll be in your lifetime. You'll have something. Well, this has been awesome. If we have any other questions, we can answer them. But what I would like to do is obviously thank Dr. Withington today, who was fantastic. We will, um, this was recorded, so we will be posting this on our YouTube. 
Um, but I want to give a little shameless plug that a lot of people in this group have been an instrumental part. This is a new group we're calling In Motion. And we're really excited because by the first of the year, we're going to have a book just for you guys. And there are some really special people, including Dr. Verma and Dr. Withington and some of our friends here who helped us come up with this. So we really are excited to share this resource and we will especially share with this group once it is complete, but we are constantly um, looking for ways to support our families and our kids. And we're really proud um, to launch this newer program for our tweens. Um, it's a really special age and we hope to have more programming like we just did with Dr. Willington tonight. We have some other things coming down after the first of the year. Um, we're really excited about, but stay tuned. And if you want to get further involved, I know we're going to send a few people um, information on our in transit, which is our teen group. Um, we have obviously literature for that group and we have a group. And as Dr. Verma mentioned, there's a national group of teens that meets as well every few months. So um, lots of ways to get involved and feel supported. There's a whole community out here to help you along this journey including our team here at University of Chicago. But Dr. Verma and Dr. Whittington, do you have anything else before we wrap this evening? I just will say if anyone has any ideas and anything that you feel your age group needs, reach out to us. Let us know. We are here to help and work with you. We don't know all the questions. We don't know all the answers, but we can all work together to try and get to some of them. So if anyone has any ideas, anyone feels like they can, or we need to do anything different, please let us know. Yeah. But we're just so appreciative that everyone joined tonight. Dr. Withington, thank you. I don't know if you have anything you want to say before you wrap? No, just thank you for letting me be part of this. And I loved hearing from all of the kids in, um, the group, like I think that that's where we get the richest information from. So thank you for being so brave and speaking up and sharing your experiences. That was really, really powerful. It was awesome. And Dr. Withington is going to be a mom soon. So we wish her the very best. Thank you. And so happy. So I hope you guys have a great Halloween if you celebrate and next week have fun and we will be in touch with a lot more information. All right. Thank you all.